Thank you all so much for coming out very early this morning. I know you have other places to do, go and things to do, so I really appreciate it. If I haven't introduced myself to you, I'm Sally Rubin. I'm the Executive Director of the Great Swamp Watershed Association. And we are going to be starting the Municipal Alliance of Towns in the Great Swamp and along the Upper Passaic. And this is our kind of kickoff meeting. Um, I'm very interested to speak with you after you hear Frank's uh, talk this morning to see what kinds of issues you'd like to discuss. But it's basically going to be a forum for conversation among municipalities, things that we can do, on, address on a regional basis, things like deer management. They just jump from one town to the other and you know, <laughs> have to address it all together. Uh, open space stewardship, um, shared services, flooding. Oh, when we say flooding, even just the last couple of days, we've seen a lot of water in our region. Um, there's a program called Community Rating System that if your town is not in, and Carroll, I know Bernard's Township is probably the only, only town that's represented here that participates in CRS. And what it does is it saves uh, the, the property owners in your communities um, on their flood insurance premiums. And with flood insurance rates going up, um, it's more important than ever, and it also makes your town more flood resilient. So we'd like to be able to address those kinds of topics. Um, but I'd be very interested to hear what you would like to discuss, because I think we can create a forum for conversation come with an issue, you know, we're doing this in my town, I'm having a problem, has anybody else solved that problem? Come and say, hey, we're doing this, it's a great thing, maybe you guys want to consider doing it as well. So whatever it is, um, we'd like to engage in dialogue. And with that, I'm probably just going to introduce Frank, who's been in the planning business for like over 30 years. So, so <laughs> just a couple of years. Uh, many of you know him, if not, uh, please, you'll thoroughly enjoy his presentation. I see a lot of familiar faces and friendly faces. I think all the familiar faces are friendly, which is always a good thing. <laughs> um, I'm going to try to run through a considerable amount of material today to do a little thought provoking. So when you hear me say there's 60 slides to go through, I can do that in two hours and I can do that in 20 minutes. I'm looking to do the 20 minute version. I'll just give you a little bit of an idea of who you're listening to today. I graduated from uh, the architecture department at Princeton University in 1972. My thesis advisor was J. Robert Hillier, who's an architect of some of our I should say. Um, my jury reviewer was Andres Dwayne and his wife, Liz Plater Zyberg, who are the major proponents of neo traditional new urbanist design, sat next to me. So I have a background in urban design from way back. But I've really spent the last 40 years as a planner largely doing resource management planning. Basically trying to program growth in places where it belongs and to stem the tide of suburban sprawl. And I spent an awful lot of sleepless nights thinking that if I didn't succeed, and so we represented towns like Bedminster where they did some substantial rezoning and have been able to preserve a lot of property. And we've done very similar things in East Amwell and Hopewell and Burns Township. Lots of places that have done good planning for a very long time. <coughs> but what I found myself most called to now is recognizing that the old rules really don't apply the way they used to. Number one, it wasn't us that was going to stop sprawl, it was the marketplace, and in fact, it's doing it as we see it again. And the quality and the vitality of the places we live is going to determine whether New Jersey is a place that people choose in the future or not. So we're now going to be called on to make choices that basically say, forget what you thought before because the rules are changing. Think differently. And you're going to hear a lot of snake oil salesmen coming in and saying, we can't use this property anymore. You've got to let us do this to the variance. So a large part of why we're talking today is because I think that with a little forethought, you can get ahead of that so that the vision that's being played out in your town is your vision and not some developer's vision. And it also means that you can make decisions that, as other towns are losing rateables because the tenants go away and the building gets torn down, you may have made some smarter choices earlier. But it's going to take some new thinking. So I'd like to run through a couple of thoughts about what that new thinking is. Now, there's a clicker here. I got great directions from Steve. I think I can even do this. Uh, when I say the own 20th century paradigms, there are a bunch of things we've all agreed for a long, long time are concerns. And we'll grapple with some of those, but I do think that many of yesterday's rules are very bad advice for tomorrow, and 
having written many of them. I, I'm in the course of working with my clients to go back and figure out what we have to do differently. So let's look at a few facts. Single family housing in New Jersey was the thing that made our neighborhoods great. Everybody wanted to move from a city to a nice single family neighborhood, have your own lot, raise your kids in a nice backyard. My parents did it, probably your parents did it. It was a very popular thing to do. Even though I was born in Weebachan and I grew up in Hudson County for a while, I ended up moving to Bergen County, Mercer County, Hunterdon County. I guess unless I go to Cumberland County, I've got to leave the state to get any further out. And so all the time that I was moving out, I thought that was a wonderful thing to do and place to be. Delaware Township's a great town to live in. The kids thanked me for growing up there, and now it's time for everybody to move. They don't want to live there anymore. I don't want to say I don't want to live there anymore, but I have dynamics in my life that make me think I could, I'd love to live in a place like Morristown. And uh, when we think that multifamily housing was at one point kind of the scourge, you did everything you could to avoid having those people, supposedly. Those people are us. Many of us don't even want home. We don't want to pay the taxes. We don't want to do the maintenance. So there are a lot of reasons why multifamily housing is becoming uh, extremely strong in the marketplace and will be for a long time. It's because there is this demographic title of baby boomers and the people born after 1980 who are all looking for that something different from where we've lived for the last 20 or 30 years. As we make those choices, we're going to see that there will be uh, a lot of disruption in the marketplace. The uh, article that I have in front of you here just ha touches on a couple of points that I think are worth mentioning. James Hughes, who's the dean of the Blasting Planning School of Rutgers, generally not a doom and gloom kind of guy, said with no uh, lack of certainty that 25% of our suburban office space along the highway corridors that have been mostly developed through that 1970s and 80s up to the end of the 80s period, 25% of that either needs to be turned into something else or torn down and go away. Because we won't have a market for it now or for so long that it won't matter. That's, that's a striking change from when we thought those were the clean rateables everybody wanted. You didn't want the industry that made stuff. You wanted the industry that made people work in the building of this point. And we did a lot of that. Everybody did a lot of that. And certainly I helped towns do a lot of that. So it's always a little tough when you're here talking about all the things we did wrong and you were responsible for a lot of them. So I'm we'll trying to hold up to that. Uh, when we look at the change in the dynamics of office markets, the internet has taken away a lot of need for actual floor area. The way we now appeal to employees is to put them in environments that are not parked out on some highway where you got to get in your car and drive 20 minutes for your hour lunch hour. But they want to be in places where you walk out the door and you walk around the town like this. And you're in the middle of things where people are and things are. So we have this tremendous uh, inventory of these suburban offices that we don't even know we had trouble with because the internet's going to continue to take a bite. The way we put people in spaces as opposed to not having them work in a designated space is changing all the time. So they're going to be really radical changes and you're going to have people in your town if they're not there yet telling you we can't use this space anymore. You have to let us do something else with the property. When we look at the, now this is a March 19th article. Uh, I'm happy to say, having been the pit planner in Modell when I wrote their 1994 master plan and hoping that there would be some long-term future for the Bell Labs property, after being vacant since, built in 1962, vacant since 2006, and on the ropes for years before 2006, there is a developer now that's come forward who's going to make a mixed-use, multi-purposed, repurposing of this entire complex with some additional development off to the side. But in general, what's been so iconic about this 473 acres is the land plan. The building in the middle, the loop roads that were very architecturally, if you look at it from the, from the air and obviously have a sense of design, most of that will be able to remain now because instead of tearing this building down, somebody figured out how to repurpose it. One of the problems my office developed friends found me is that when you try to repurpose office buildings for residential, the floor plate is too wide. You're going to end up with places that can't have windows because there's just too much in the middle part. You know, there's windows on this side, windows on this side. So they're not going to be easy decisions we're going to have to make. And they're not always going to be the smartest people making them for us. Some of the developers are going to come with a variety of interests that may not be your interests. I'm pointing to this one example, which is of Montana Road and Mars Plains. I happened to be driving by last week, and I couldn't help but notice this pile of trouble. And I thought to myself, geez, what used to be there? 
And I'm showing you this not because I have any particular perspective on this property or answers to questions that it might provoke, but it provokes some questions for me that I think you'll have to think about over and over again. When we look at this property, if you look at Sun Valley Way, those houses are <coughs> uphill from the property that is in the middle of the drawing, which is where the buildings were torn down. Across the street, this is the same shot without the streets left. Across the street, we have some Johnson & Johnson and other office space. And this is what was there up until that demolition project took hold. And these are, you know, it's great that you can go to Google and find out what used to be there. I always want to find out what's there today, but I've actually found out what used to be there to really help. So this shot, taken in a tilted angle from being in a, during a period when the demolition was underway, gives you a little bit of a sense of the juxtaposition of the residential development in the background. Uh, major intersection, obviously a good location for some development. And the question really is, who's going to drive the bus on this? What kind of place will this be when we're done? Is it going to be some developer's dream and some town's nightmare? Yes? There is a developer that is actually in litigation against the borough right now. He's proposing 800 units of multifamily housing. There is a train station within a half, within a half mile mm -hmm. of the site. And I think one of the things we have to think about, no matter who the developer is, is what's good for the town. Because we're so used to being in this juxtaposition where the developer does something we don't want, that it's really hard to think that he's going to come in and we're going to think more like working partners to get what we want. Because what they tore down here had real economic value, fiscal impact on the town. And whatever they put back will have an impact, maybe better, maybe worse. But I think the decision process, and that's what we're going to look at in just a second in another case, the decision process about what type of place to become is the most critical part of this. It's like the goals and the master plan. If you do that part right, you can always go back to the goals and say, does this action get us there? And if it doesn't, then you're not supposed to do that or change the goals, whatever. It's doing so good with this clip. Mm -hmm. um, so changes of sort of sweeping proportions, filtering down is the theory of affordable housing that has said there's a certain amount we don't need to build because everybody's evacuating the cities and leaving behind undesirable housing that filters down to people of lesser means. Well, now we live in a time where housing is actually filtering up. We have people of greater means moving back and out competing people who, you know, a building that had five families living in five separate units could be a very nice one family building. And it's happening all the time in cities all over the town. Like I said, 25% of our office space will not be needed and we met all our needs through 2043. Now, I don't even think that forecasts any continuing erosion due to the internet and other marketplace variables. We have enough retail space to meet demand until 2031, yet the retail model, the real estate model still says the bank will lend me money and somebody will write a study that says I can sell stuff here, I'm going to build it on the highway because it's zoned for. These are the kinds of things we have to think about. When you look at this comparison, the most striking thing on the screen is <coughs> Somerset County, Morris County, you're looking at a vacancy rate almost the same as Detroit for office space. In Detroit, it's not the worst place in the country, but it's got an awful lot of problems right now. This is a big part of it. Density, you know, there's, old, there's a, a, a book that I looked at some time ago called Density by Design. I forget who wrote it. But what I learned over the years is density is a dirty word. If you want to talk about density, show me the picture. Don't show me the work. Don't tell me the number of 10 units or God, 20 units per acre. As soon as you talk like that, I don't want to be around you. As a planner, I can lose my job. And my problem right now is if I don't talk like that, I'm really not doing my job because you have to look at the choices that you get when you accept density. So let's put the 800 units on that particular property aside because I really didn't come to discuss that specifically. But that case example is a great one. Because whether it's 800 units here, or I'm working in Hopewell Township or I'm the planner, Merrill Lynch came in, got an approval for 4 million square feet, built one side of Scotts Road just off the interchange on 95, never built the other side. People who bought the Merrill Lynch buildings for $45 a square foot, which are the nicest office buildings in Mercer County, uh, also bought the property across the street and have almost no cost basis. So they're coming to us saying, what do you want us to do with this? We need to build something here. We think it should be housing. They brought us a, a Dell Web proposal, and it was a low single story, single family retirement community. And we thought to ourselves, what could be less like a walkable, engaging kind of place than a single use gated community that really kind of keeps everybody else out? So we're going to see that if you're willing to give some density, the things you can get back 
will be striking because there'll be place making in a way where people want to live in those places. Multifamily housing is not going to be the weak stepsister anymore. It's going to be, there will be luxury apartments and people won't care that they can't buy them because they won't really want to buy them. But there will be luxury housing in New Jersey of a caliber we haven't seen before because the wealth that's in Morris County, Somerset County, Hunterdon County is unparalleled in the country. You can't go any other place in the country and find three counties that share the top ten category of wealth in the country. I can just give a quick example. We did a quick survey. There's 31 concept in review approved developments with over 7,500 units now in Morris County alone. And it runs the gamut of you know what's in Morristown, the latitude development, to areas that are really on the outskirts of, you know, they're replacing, like I said, the single family homes. So they're the developers, it's the development du jour right now. That is what we're seeing. Right, and what they're all going to come in and tell you is if there's a market for mixed use at all, they're going to tell you they want a five-story building. The top four floors are something built to proposal that you go that high. It's frame construction. The bottom floor is going to be 20 feet high. It's a concrete box, and you build everything else on top of that, and that's your retail and other non-residential space. And that's the one-size-fits-all panacea. And the bad news is half the time it might be exactly the right thing, and the other half the time it's probably not the right thing. But it's not what your ordinance permits today. And people on your planning board and on your governing bodies are going to fight for the status quo because we worked hard to get there. We defended it in court. Why are we now going to turn around and give developers what they want? And the answer to that question is all about your fiscal sanity in the 21st century. Do you, I was at a meeting in Berners Township and I was stunned on reorganization night to hear about, I'm not trying to embarrass you, Carol, but to hear about the, the, the extent to which the financial management in Berners Township kind of rises to a level recognized around the country. There are skill sets here that can be shared. You know, sometimes we need to share skill sets that the more affluent have with the less affluent, but sometimes we can just look around the corner. Somebody needs to know what's figured out, and they don't have to figure it out for themselves. So when we look at prospective buyers and tenants in these office buildings that are saying to people like Advance, <coughs> we're leaving, we're going to Hoboken, or not so, not so much Hoboken, any central place where there's an opportunity to walk to lunch right around the corner, people on the street, those are the offices people want to be in now. So as they abandon your suburban location, what's going to happen? If you don't get ahead of that decision, somebody else will be there for you. Young adults are leaving these suburban communities in droves. And the truth is, there isn't enough hope of them. And there isn't enough money that these kids have in their pockets to go to Brooklyn and all the places that, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, there was so much opportunity in New York. Well, now we live in a place where that opportunity is right here. Down in Brantsburg, it's in all kinds of places that you wouldn't have expected before. So, smaller, more affordable houses, more rental, those are all things we're going to see changing. I want to run you quickly through this Flemington example because I think it gives a lot of insight into it. I think they're doing a lot of things right. And, like I said, I'm not the town planner there, but I was one of the founding members of the Business Improvement District, which cost me $1,600 a year extra to taxes. <laughs> My neighbors all remind me of that all the time. Uh, Flemington is the town that has the single notoriety of having had the Lindbergh baby kidnapping trial there in 1934. So the whole world knew about Flemington for five minutes, and then it was over. And we keep trying to think that that's our claim to fame. Actually, that's really not Flemington's claim to fame. When I was retained by the borough some years ago to do a visioning process for them, we started out with a series of meetings and tools that we used, and I want to show you quickly what those tools were. We defined the borough in terms of the character of different parts of it. So we have the historic downtown and green in the center. That purple area, the entire town's a historic district because back before Chippo knew what people could get away with when they did stuff like this. They drew a line around everything that sort of was the limits of where anything historic was. And they called it a district. So if you go in and look at the significance of every one of those buildings, we don't have that kind of an inventory to tell you that. So it has to go back and do that. Nonetheless, it is an authentically historic town. Very few people would debate the designation that it this Envision Flemington project was something I did with Juan Su Gable, who's a professor at Rutgers, who developed this uh, software that we use to engage the public. We used to do this with laptops or, or desktops. Now we can do it all on uh, handheld machines and set up for both iPhones and uh, Android phones. So when you look at this, this is kind of old school. Get, take a post-it, write a note on the plan, on the aerial photo, and tell us something you think is bad, good, should happen, whatever. At the end of the process, we go back and take all those comments, associate them with the site about which they were uh, suggested, and do some assessment of what all those things mean. 
Um, the Envision Funding website let people go on the site and create a location. See, I didn't demonstrate a lot, but if you went on, you could put the push pin on, and you could upload as many photos as you wanted. They would say thousands, not a problem. Videos, all kinds of things like that. So the person that's the stakeholder in the field who wants to be in this game you're doing, changing policy, can step up 24 hours 7. You can be a participant in this public meeting that we're always having. And what comes out of that process is when you get a shared vision that people have participated in and bought into, the resistance to change really goes away. All of a sudden, people recognize that the dynamic of change is positive, not negative, and that the failure to change will actually have negative consequences. That takes a while to get to. When they did this in Flemington, they mostly said, we want to be the kind of a place with lots of great restaurants, the kind of retail that people stroll the streets like they used to do 30 years in our town, and that will have lots of lively street life, pedestrian traffic. And we believe multi-story mixed-use buildings and shared parking, which uh, exist in parts of town but not on the scale we're talking about, were really important things to, uh, to bring in. The revitalization suggestions all seem to be about authentic place. When we first had our very first meeting in, in uh, Old Courthouse, and I said to people, you know, what do you think Flemington needs? Somebody stood up right away and said, we need a theme. You know, when downtowns get redeveloped, they get a theme, and they put all that stuff on the street, and they hang the banners, and that's their theme. That's their brand. And somebody else got up and said, somebody on the Star Preservation Commission got up and said, we got lots of themes. Which one do you want? And the truth was, when you look around Flemington, besides the dead baby story, we have the tradition, the pottery tradition that was reflected through the Bill Fulper Spangle families. Uh, we have forges and foundries, and so we, we have the old egg auction. We have so many things that are unique to that kind of a center in the middle of a very rural area. But in addition to uh, recognizing our tourism value through those things. People want the kind of stuff everybody wants. They want theaters and they want, and they want cultural event space. They want the kind of things that make a place desirable so that visitors come there and residents stay there and do things. So they identified outdoor dining as one of the key things. They said when you drive down the street and you see people out there eating, you want to stop. If you want to go see what's going on, you can tell someone what's going on. But they went through this whole series of art and entertainment kind of uses that people thought were needed. Performing Arts Center. Now, we're about the smallest place I know I'm talking about trying to do a performing arts center that has nothing at all. We got our movie theater, theaters torn down. Mm -hmm. One of them a very historic building. But through the process that the bid went through, they did identify some potential theater sites, and we actually have some uh, theater group from Mercer County that is without a home and looking to get one in Fleming. The bid provided a retail analysis through a consultant that looked at all these trends and found that there were supportable businesses in the downtown and in our market area that are identified here on the bottom. And they tend to be the kinds of things people are going to those kinds of places for, apparel, home furnishings, restaurants. Everybody thought there was no parking in town, and yet when I did the wayfinding study for the signs that they put up around town, we noticed that there's just a tremendous amount of parking. It's just not very well signed. You drive from town now, you see a bunch of new signs that they put up because you couldn't find a parking, but it's still there. They have a streetscape strategy that they developed with a consultant, which I think is a key part of making a town special. Okay, so in front of the old courthouse, you see the picture of the old courthouse here. And in the area that is represented by this variable pavement, this will be an area, this is a main county road, so the traffic pattern from to Easton, one of the choices is right through the middle of Flemington, and it's pretty well promoted by the improvements they've made to the road. So when you're coming through Flemington in the morning or in the afternoon, don't bother trying to stop because it's just through traffic. Part of what we need to do is control traffic better, and part of what we want to accomplish is to create a profound space in the middle of town. So you'll notice that if I need to shut off the street and have that be the event space between the old historic courthouse and all the county buildings and the hotel, it's a very easy thing for us to do. We've got traffic coming in, we can convert them both ways. So this is a feature like what Somerville, <coughs> when Somerville first put the division street improvements in. I don't know how many of you are familiar, but they completely closed the street. Initially, they were going to partly close it, and bothered it, and be able to open and close it for events. They decided it was a better place for arts and culture. They just closed the street completely and made it a pedestrian place. And it's a block from the train station. You literally walk one block and you're in the post office and the train station. That's a technique that has brought them thousands of visitors every year to a new venue that didn't exist before. 
we're looking to create things like that here. We've got a series of gateway entries coming into town that would have signage and other improvements. But the bid has really, what's interesting is the business improvement district has taken a lot of heat because whenever you spend tax money, people a lot of heat. Um, in the early going, we seemed relatively ineffectual. There's so much inertia to overcome to get things up and going. So we were mostly doing car shows and events. And the kind of program that's great, it's great to bring the crowd to town. Except Sunday, if you're not having that event, the streets are completely empty. So they came up with a strategic plan, partly for business attraction and retention, and partly for urban redevelopment. And what they did was they hired Tim DeLorean, who's a planner that I respect a lot. Uh, and he came in and did a study where he looked at six sites in the town and tried to give them a comparative example of what you might do. So this, this is the block of the Union Hotel on the far left of the photo. The, photo. <coughs> the Barbo Flemington owns the brick building, which is modeled after Ford's Theater, and the building uh, closer to us, and all the parking in the back. So the borough's a key player in redevelopment of this block. Tim came up with a series of ideas and provided these graphics to illustrate how these things uh, might be developed. This is you know, very illustrative. Nobody's going to build this plan, but ironically, the planning board and the governing body that were very challenged by the thought that the bid would start planning, all of a sudden are showing ownership of these ideas because everybody in town liked them. So when you look at that, that visual, and then you look at that visual, here people can imagine why I would give you density. Okay, I can get that there's bunch of stuff that comes out of that, so I can go for that. We looked at another one, this artist Sally over on, on Fulber Street, which is an uh, underutilized, to say the least, kind of place. And Tim's ideas for the cluster of artists that could be uh, brought here and attracted here is shown in that exhibit. A restaurant row, galleries, specialty shops. This looks like pie in the sky stuff. If you drive through Flemington today and see how many vacancies we have, you would think that we've got to be out of our mind. For me, I get such a chuckle out of that because I know it can't not work. If we do everything wrong, the demographics are going to make something good happen, or at least going to put the kind of pressure on the town that economic investment can happen if they're receptive to it. And that's the key thing here. When you're thinking of your physical sanity in the future, the economic investment people are willing to make in your town for a thing you like is a really good thing. You don't want to be in the way of that if you can avoid it. So here's another one of those imagined places. And again, when we talk about densities like 25 or 30 units per acre, as soon as I say that and you find out that the hills in Bedminster is 10 units per acre, you know, who wants 30 units per acre? Well, when you find out what you get with 30 units per acre, maybe you do, you don't know yet. Last example, and one that I take a lot of pride of, because when I went through this whole process, I fell in love with this building. And then some crazy guy from out of town came and convinced me that I should buy it. And while he didn't have the money it took to buy it, and I didn't either, my third partner did, and so we bought this a couple of years ago when it was in the condition you see there. The exhibit on the, the photo on the bottom shows it back when it was the Fulber Pottery, pretty much the same building is there today as it was then. And this came out of this recommendation. The visioning process said build on our historic themes, especially the artists and heritage. Reuse the Stangle Pottery Factory for an artist and building. Mm -hmm. This is what I did, but this is, I, I didn't write this. The people in town said do this, and nobody was going to do this. People wanted to tear it down and put a Section 8 half in there. So redevelopment of these key uh, cultural sites was a very important thing. This building, my partner wasn't at all concerned that it was in really good shape and we weren't worried about you know, how much it would need. Well, it ended up needing to be taken apart and put back together again because half the block was bad. But it is put back together again. Uh, and as a result of that, a restaurant with outdoor dining is now on Mine Street, which is a major through route to be a town and uh, And people coming into Flemington are now other than bumping into the dumpsters and the other stuff that used to be cl cluttering the back end of this building, they're finding real street life. We have a pottery. Those are teaching wheels that you see in the middle of the picture here. Uh, this potter was over in Frenchtown, lost his lease, needed a place to go right when we bought the building. We have a co-op art gallery that my daughter started with a couple of artists and some other artists have continued. And we have events like poetry readings and storytelling, in addition to all kinds of art events. We also rent out the, the we saved about 6,000 square feet of factory floor space as an event venue, because there is no event venue with money. So we've been able to rent it out probably 20 times for these. A lot of them are uh, the kind of uh, fundraisers that are done by nonprofits, and so we're always giving them the nonprofit rate. But the truth is, 
we've been able to sustain the cost of having this property with a whole variety of things like this farmer's market that we've had for over two years every Saturday indoors. And when we first opened the farmer's market, there was a lot of fear on my part and on people's part that Flemington wasn't big enough for two farm markets. And the more farmers had a great outdoor farm market that I go to still will always. Uh, and what it turned out was that there is one group of people that will frequent the board because they want sort of the down in the dirt authentic version of a farm market. And there are the people in town that will come and buy all kinds of stuff in our market, including organic vegetables and things. But what we're doing is we're creating a destination in a building that used to be a major destination. This was the seconds outlet. Stangle only made pottery here from 1925 to 1934. Then they bought the pottery where the baseball stadium sits down in Trenton. Moved everything there, and all they did was ship back chips and pens to sell it.